Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Anchor Church. It's great to see you here today. I look forward to this time in worship. Uh, I've been looking forward to this time in worship all week long because what we get to do today is turn all of our, our attention, all of our beings toward the one who saved us, Amen. the one who brought us into new life, the one that has given us a, a hope and a future. Uh, we get to worship Jesus together in, our, in scripture, in song, in prayer, and in fellowship. So I'm glad that you're here today to be a part of that. At Hope and Anchor Church, we will glorify God and make disciples by leveraging our diverse giftings and experiences, our hospitality, and our community connections in a context of generational trauma and poverty, wariness of the church, and rejection of truth because we have a passion for creativity, for the pursuit of truth, and care for the alienated and overlooked. Here at Hope and Anchor Church, we view the giving of tithes and offerings as an intimate expression of faith and worship. And so uh, in the room, there's a couple baskets. There's an iPad. You can also give online uh, or through Planning Center. Uh, but long story short, we want to make sure we provide ways for you to worship in that meaningful way. So uh, be sure and uh, take part in that. This morning, uh, we're going to read our gathering prayer. And just like last week, uh, we're going to start something new. After our gathering prayer, I'm going to have everyone remain standing and we're going to recite a psalm together, or a portion of a psalm, uh, so that our first song that we uh, join into together is from Scripture. It's the, the psalm that uh, is given to us in that ancient prayer book so that uh, uh, we can start in the right place. We can say to God and answer to God that which has been uh, said to God and answered to God for, for millennia. We join our voices with the... Uh, ongoing stream of the voices of the faithful throughout history. So uh, I've asked Victoria to read our gathering prayer this morning, so if you'll please stand. Your love, O oh God, is boundless. We who were strangers have been made your children. We who were defenseless have been brought into your household. Keep us mindful of your deeds of mercy, that we may love you with our whole heart and love our neighbor as ourselves. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Let's recite Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8 together. As soon as it comes up. O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. In this harsh and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I raise you. Your strong right hand holds me secure. I will praise you as long as I live. Lifting up my hands to you in prayer, you satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my hope. I see you for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me secure. Let's worship God together.
pull me a little closer. So pull me a little closer. Take me a little deeper. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. So love is so much stronger than anything I've tasted. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. Cheers.
bless you today, Lord. We thank you so much for this time just to worship you together, God, with family and friends. What a beautiful sound, God, we can make a joyful sound, Lord, unto you. I pray you continue to help us to grow together this morning, God. We thank you so much for that. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. All right, good morning once again. Excited to open God's Word this morning. You know what? Today we are continuing in our brand new teaching series called Rock of Ages. This is week number two in our learning adventure, our time spent walking with uh, the Apostle Peter. What we're doing is we're spending the first several weeks of this series just getting to know Simon Peter. Basically the guy that Jesus sought out and called to follow him and would later be established as the founder of the church. Um, Jesus is the one that said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, it's important for us, time well spent, I think, for us to walk with Peter and uh, get to know him, kind of get a, a feel for the world in which he lived. Uh, today, I want to talk about his encounter with Jesus and how that kind of changed everything. It didn't just change his paradigm, how he kind of understood the world and what his future looked like, but it also changed his circumstances. And that's kind of what happens to us, right? When we encounter Jesus, it changes our direction. It changes our, our vision and our values. It changes who we are. And so today's message is called Then Jesus. Then Jesus. Because that's really, that encapsulates so many of the stories of the people we read about in the Bible. When they encountered Christ, then Jesus came. But that's really our story, too. We're all living a then Jesus sort of life, right? If you've come to faith in Jesus, Jesus has encountered you, and there's a then Jesus in your life as well. So that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. It begins when we're young. When we are young, we imagine that we, uh, we, we start thinking about who we will be when we grow up. Do you remember what? What you thought you would be when you grew up? Uh, was it an astronaut? Maybe it was a doctor or a firefighter. Maybe the president. Or maybe a golf course turf specialist. I had a friend in college that, that he wanted to get his graduate degree in turf management. At the time, I couldn't really see beyond myself. I was pretty self-absorbed, as some people are when they're in those years. But he would just get passionate about turf management. And I didn't understand it, but I think I understand it a little bit more now. I've told several people that my, uh, my dream job, if I was to quit pastoring and go get another job, just start a whole new life, I would go get a job with the park board and become a lawnmower. <laughs> like one of those guys that rides the, the like zero turn lawnmowers, headphones, listening to podcasts, just out on some you know, park, just mowing. That's, that's a dream job for me now. So I kind of rec I remember my turf management friend, and he's, that's what he does now, actually. He lived his dream. Anyway, golf course. As a child, we believe that anything is possible, don't we? We believe that just intention and desire are all that it takes to become whatever and whoever it is we want to be when we become an adult. You see, we all started, and, and, I, and I, I trust this is true for you, we all started with big dreams. No children dream of mediocrity. It's like, man, I want to grow up and work in a cubicle farm. I want to be a, working in a call center, answering calls from disgruntled customers. No one wants that. No. We all started with big dreams. But the, the sad fact is, the sad reality is, most of us have ended up doing other things. Some of us have been pressed into the world's mold, maybe been pressed into our parents' mold, and we've ended up settling. We've ended up settling for lesser dreams. Not many of us have actually ended up walking on the moon. Am I right? I mean, okay, I think so, Eric, okay. Not many of us have ended up walking on the moon. Not, uh, not many of us have ended up saving lives in surgery or sitting in the Oval Office or manicuring golf greens, for that matter. But, I mean, that is not to say, though, that our dreams of, of childhood didn't turn into a different dreams that we also are thankful for, right? I'm not trying to be that big of a Debbie Downer, right? Um, most of us have ended up doing something else that we love. Uh, as a kid, I never thought about, man, it's going to be great being a husband. 
It's going to be great being a father. Uh, I'm going to love being a pastor. I didn't even know I was going to be a pastor, right? So I've ended up, by God's grace, doing things I love, things I enjoy, but they aren't the things I dreamed of as a child. In middle school, I took an aptitude test. I don't know if you still do this in middle school, but I took an aptitude test that kind of uh, uh, was an inventory, and it talked about possible career fields you might be good at or might kind of come naturally to you. I took an aptitude test in middle school, and it suggested vocations that might fit my temperament and my interests, and it gave me two suggestions, two jobs I ought to prefer uh, based on what my aptitudes are. It said I should be a clown <laughs> or clergy. I don't like clowns, so I figured being a pastor <laughs> was, <laughs> was a uh, clown or cl clergy. What? Is that even a career field? I mean, really, if I was wanting to be a clown, where would I even start? Can you put that on like Indeed? I mean, are those jobs posted? A clown or a clergy? Did anyone else take this aptitude test? Do you remember it? Kenny, what did it say for you? Do you remember? <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Yikes. Anyone else? Aptitude test? All right. Um, so what is it that you wanted to be when you grew up? Do you remember what you wanted to be when you were a kid? Who you thought you'd be when you grew up? Are you doing it? Is anyone here doing what they dreamed of doing as a kid? Pat, what would you dream of doing as a kid? Being a Being a teacher. Yeah, good. Oh, I think I saw some other hands too. Other, that's common among teachers, I think. They knew early on. That's great. Uh, to unzip the viscera a little bit on my life, uh, for a couple of years while growing up, I, I really wanted to be a professional break dancer. I think I've told some of you this, some of my closest friends in these intimate relationships. Uh, I wanted to be a professional break dancer. Now, you might be skeptical, but in my estimation, for a skinny kid from Missouri, I, I really was a contender. Among my circle of friends, I was a contender um, on that cardboard. On the cardboard, during my early teen years, I could do the worm better than anyone. I could moonwalk, I would practice this in class, which was weird, but um, doing the Russian, things like that, I was pretty good. I was pretty good. Uh, in the early 80s though, there was no way of knowing at that point in time that breakdancing would never become a viable career field. I mean, I'd set my future aspiration on this, thinking that this would be a whole industry that I could be a part of. But it never became a viable career field. That industry didn't grow or flourish. I'm not sure why, though. Uh, it's, uh, the market for breakdancers either never really developed or it just never gained traction in Springfield, Missouri. Or maybe it was a bit of both. I don't know. You might, you might study market analytics and know, but I don't know why breakdancing never really took off. You see, there is an, a universal inclination among human beings to be future-oriented, to think about the future, to imagine a future and anticipate how they will fit into that imagined future. And I don't believe this is just a modern phenomenon. I don't believe this is just a Western thing. I think it's always been that with us humans. I think cavemen children probably dreamt. I think cavemen children probably thought about the future and what they would become. Uh, this being the case, I also wonder then about the people in the Bible. Did Bible characters dream about the future too? How many of these Bible characters that we read about when they were children thought, hey, someday I'm gonna be an astronaut or whatever. I mean, they, maybe, I mean, they were maybe very future oriented, but you know, what were the dreams that they had about, I'm gonna grow up and be this, or I'm gonna grow up and be that. Did they dream about those things or was it more mundane? Did, did uh, shepherds just dream about being shepherds? Did uh, soldiers just have soldiering dreams? Did fishermen always dream about fishing, even from childhood? At what age were these children's high-flying dreams dragged down to earth by circumstance or by un cold, unforgiving reality? After how many nights with the flock after how many hot days casting a net, after how many days of marching did dreams dissipate and reality set in? I'm never going to be an astronaut. I don't think I'm ever going to walk on the moon. Now, it's easy to feel sad and feel like, oh, everyone's dreams are crushed. But think about this, though, too. While I imagine innumerable kids had their dreams dashed 
then just as now. Um, I think some people in the Bible that we read about, they actually ended up living lives that they couldn't even really imagine. They ended up living lives beyond their wildest ambitions. They found themselves unsuspectingly, un, 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 unexpectedly, found themselves caught up in a bonkers with God type of adventure. I mean, you read some of these stories, and you're like, I don't think they had any idea this was coming, right? They got swept up in this, this with God adventure that just blew their mind. Specifically, I'm thinking about the disciples today. Think about the disciples. Uh, those who were called by Jesus to follow him, the likes of James and John, Andrew and Peter, Matthew and the others. They had all been, to one degree or another, settling in to a predictable lifestyle. They had all been settling into a predictable career. Some of them careers in fishing, some of them uh, careers working for the government and tax collecting or whatever. But then Jesus, then Jesus came along. Then Jesus came along and changed everything. Jesus came and invited them into a wildly different calling, a wildly different vocation, and a wildly different future. What was it like? Use your imagination here. What was it like for Simon, who was later called Peter? Uh, what was it like for him to have his then Jesus moment? He was a Galilean fisherman, which was kind of a backwater. I mean, a very rural, hardworking place. A, a Galilean fisherman in a family business with his brother and his dad. He was headstrong. He was simple. He was hardworking. And he was tough. There he was, day after day, just being Simon, working in the family business. Originally from a town called Bethsaida, Peter's father, who was named Jonah, or sometimes it reads John in our translations, he had taken some boats, he had acquired some boats and taken them to a city or a town called Capernaum, where they had established their fishing operations. Now, why did they go to Capernaum? Well, it's likely that Jonah, uh, the father of Peter and Andrew, uh, it's possible that his fishing business was in partnership with another man named Zebedee. Does anyone know who Zebedee is? He's the father of James and John, right? Who also had a fishing business. And I never, before studying this passage, I never saw the connection here that maybe they knew each other previously and maybe they were actually in business together. Their fishing, uh, fishing endeavors were actually part of the same company or the same business venture. Also, did you know this? Peter was married. Now, I hope to add some texture here. But Peter's not just this two-dimensional Bible character. He was married. He slept in a bed. He had a wife. He had kids, potentially. He was sharing his home with his mother-in-law, his extended family. They're all living together. Mom, kids, mother-in-law. Peter's life had likely assumed a certain rhythm over the years. A certain rhythm with days spent casting nets from a bass boat, pulling in those nets, uh, looking forward to simple nights at home with his wife and his kids, looking forward to dinner. As with most Jewish boys at the time, Peter, Andrew, James, and John had given up dreams of, being, of ever being called to follow a rabbi. This wasn't in their future. They were told in no uncertain terms, you do not have what it takes to be a Talmudim. You do not have what it takes to be a disciple of a rabbi. You don't. So pursue other endeavors, pursue other careers. You will never be a Talmudim. Like so many others, the disciples long ago had been told that they didn't have what it took to be the spiritual elite, the leaders of the religious life of Israel. But then Jesus, then Jesus comes along and he pulls the rug out from under everything. So what I want to do today is I want to walk through the four gospel accounts of the calling of, of Peter, of Simon, and see how Jesus comes to them and how Jesus comes back to them and is like, hey, I want you to come with me. I want you to come with me. And in saying that, he's saying, I see something in you. I believe something about you. And I think you have what it takes. I think you have what it takes. First, let's look at the gospel account of Jesus calling Peter in the gospel of Matthew. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. 
One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too, and they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. So here, yeah, he's calling Peter and Andrew, and then James and John, right along the same coastline. Okay, let's look at Mark, Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's son, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Okay, very similar, a parallel passage, Luke 5. 1 through 11. Luke 5, 1 through 11. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats on the water's edge for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat, sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. (laughs) Man, have you ever said that sentence? Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Okay, one more. Uh, John 1, 5, uh, 1, 35 through 42. The following day, John was standing, again, standing with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist, uh, this passage is talking about. The following day, John the Baptist was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following And he asked them, what what do you want? They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Peter. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, John decided to go to Galilee. Or I'm sorry, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip. Oh, I'm sorry, let's stop there. 42, that's all we're doing. Okay, so we've read four, the four stories we find in the gospel of Jesus encountering the disciples, calling Peter, Andrew, James, John. Here we get a glimpse into Peter's world. We kind of get to lift the lid and see the world in which Peter lived at the time. So we catch a glimpse, uh, and we find that his world is, is far more local, for, far more human, and far more interconnected than we sometimes think. Sometimes we just kind of hold to a surface reading of Scripture and just take it at face value. We don't look a little bit deeper into the humanity of the story. John the Baptist had become well-known in that region at the time. John the Baptist was was pretty well-known. Several people had begun to follow him. Uh, Did you know John the Baptist had disciples? He had disciples following him, 
And then when John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, he sends his disciples, like, follow that guy. You have no business following me when he's present. Follow him. So he sends Andrew and uh, the other disciple, which is probably John. John has John the, the revelator, John the writer of the gospel. He's pretty good about saying the other disciple when he's referring to himself. Like when he says the other disciple outran Peter to the tomb. <laughs> the disciple that Jesus loved. You know, he's like refers to himself kind of obliquely, but like, yeah, that's me. So John the Baptist had become well known. Several people had begun to follow him and he had, had at least two disciples that we read about in John chapter one. Uh, one of John the Baptist's disciples was Andrew, who was Peter's brother. And like I said, likely the other disciple referred to in John chapter one is the author himself, John. Uh, news had been circulating. Rumors had been spreading. Messiah has come. Messiah is here. The one who will deliver us is here, he's come. Word was starting to spread, excitement was starting to build. Messiah had come and John the Baptist had been calling people to get ready. Do you remember what John the Baptist had been telling people? Repent, turn from your evil ways, make straight, prepare and make straight the way of the Lord. Make way, make preparation for the coming of Messiah. So when Jesus comes, John the Baptist identifies him in no uncertain terms. Here he is. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When Jesus comes to him, there's excitement and there is eager response. And John the Baptist is at the front of the line saying, guys, stop following me. Follow him. Don't follow the one announcing his coming. Follow the one who has come. Follow Jesus. Now, as is often the case, invitation to follow after Jesus brought with it disruption. Has anyone ever read these stories and Jesus is like, come follow me and I'll help you uh, fish for people? Which I, I, I can't imagine didn't ex require some explanation. <laughs> like what? Do you mean that literally? You know, it's like the people that read the Bible only literally have to have trouble with this passage, right? It's like fishing for people. Okay. Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. You know? yeah. No, I mean, fishing for people, clearly it means it metaphorically, but something in how he said it and who he was convinced them that they could drop their nets, their livelihood, their identity, their family connection and responsibility to follow after Jesus. Disruption. The invitation to follow Jesus brought with it disruption. Now, most interpret the stories that we read in Matthew chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, and possibly in Luke chapter 5, to have taken place several months after the first encounter we read about, the first encounter with Jesus we read about in John chapter one, okay? We read these all together, but then we think they're all happening at the same time. But most historians and theologians think that John chapter one's account is the first encounter. And it predates the Matthew one, Mark one, and Luke five possibly story. Although Peter and the others likely continued in the fishing business, if this is true, if this is how it played out, they likely continued in the fishing businesses for a time after first meeting Jesus, and then they eventually became his full-time disciples. Eventually, Peter is taken away from the shores of Galilee to become the leader of the church. I mean, talk about a, a role reversal, a change of plans. One day he's a fisher, fisherman, and the next day he's the pope, right? I mean, like he's the first... Uh, if you talk about in the Catholic Church, they talk about Peter as the founder of the, the original Pope, of Papa, Daddy of the Church, right? But what a whirlwind. It's like, man, I was a fisherman in a family business, and now I'm established as the head of the church? Wow. Why would it, have, why would it be then, if this is the, the account, this is the timeline, that what we read about in John 1 happened uh, before Matthew 1, Mark 1, and Luke 5. Why did Jesus come and call them and then wait several months to consummate their calling? Why would Jesus do that? Why would he come to them and say, hey, something's coming, we're up to something here, but then go away and come back a few months later, several months later, to consummate his calling, to, to call them to follow him and to become his disciples? Well, one can imagine that maybe it's out of respect for, uh, maybe respect for their fathers, uh, maybe out of respect for, uh, family business. Hey, take some time, get things ready. I know this is a big disruption. 
I don't want to cause harm here. You know, get things ready. Maybe Jesus was giving them time to make preparations. Uh, maybe he was giving them so time to simply come to terms with their calling. I mean, how, was, how long did it take for them to absorb that a rabbi thinks, surely this is a mistake. I mean, it's a mistake. I've been told I don't have what it takes. And here a rabbi comes. I think this is a mistake in identity. I don't know. Why, why would he be asking me this? It, it probably took time to come to terms with that calling. Either way, it's often that way with us too. It's often this way that Jesus comes to us and he comes to us and he calls us, but sometimes there's an intervening time. There's an intervening space. You see, in my life, I came to faith in Jesus when I was 12 years old. Uh, I was 12 years old, uh, going to church my whole life with my family, but I remember when I was 12 years old, uh, I, I, I remember confessing my need for Christ and giving my life to Jesus to follow after him, to make him the Lord and Savior of my life. Now, I was 15 years old at summer camp when I felt a real vocational calling to ministry. Now, this whole other conversation, everyone's called to ministry. If you're following Jesus, you're called to ministry. You're called to serve. You're sent out as a missionary. But I was called to serve vocationally in a role like this. I didn't realize it at the time. But Jesus extended a vocational calling to ministry in my life. Jesus was all along patiently calling me to himself. I ran from that calling, though, for nine years. For nine years, I came up with excuses. For nine years, I went my own way. For nine years, I ignored and avoided what I knew God had, the calling God had placed on my heart. I did this because I felt inadequate. I did this because I felt uncomfortable with the calling. And I avoided it, too, because I was uh, living for myself. I was still... Uh, uh, serving the, 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 the desires of my life that, that, that I wanted to do, my, my sin, my flesh. I was just doing what I wanted. So, uh, yeah, I felt inadequate. Yeah, I felt uncomfortable with the calling, but I was also still uh, unregenerate in that calling. It took much time and many circumstances for me to finally and fully surrender to the calling on my life. I was doing my own things. I was living on my own terms, but then Jesus, then Jesus, after the Air Force, my wife and I and my son and almost daughter moved back, <laughs> she wasn't born yet, um, moved back to Springfield to finish my undergraduate degree at MSU or SMSU at the time. Uh, we moved back to Springfield. I was intending to pursue my dreams uh, in adventure recreation and wilderness education. That's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to live at a camp, serve at a camp, take people into the back country, have these great experiences. I was working on my undergraduate degree in recreation and leisure studies. <laughs> yeah, anyone else? Yeah, great degree, actually. They got rid of it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, but I accidentally ended, ended up working at a church. My advisor had been a director of the Christian Life Center at First Baptist Church. <laughs> And so she called over there like, hey, do you have any part-time recreation assistant jobs available? And sure enough, they did. So I started picking up a part-time job working in the church. And it wasn't long before my heart came alive. And I realized this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Something in my heart just really started to, to just connect with the people placed in my care. And I knew that God was right all along. Weird, right? God knew what he was doing. He was placed a calling intentionally on my life, and I was going to end up there whether I liked it or not. So here I am in the church, suddenly realizing, suddenly coming to terms, Jesus suddenly returning to me to call me to follow him, to lay down my nets, and to give my all to him. And there I was, a part-time rec assistant at FBC, when Jesus came back and called me to follow him. I had my then-Jesus encounter, and from that moment there was no turning back. It's led us all over the place, but here we are. I'm not turned back. Like Peter, I left my nets and I left all my plans and my dreams behind too to follow Jesus on a life-shaping, future-defining adventure. And that's exactly what it's been. Is that similar to what Jesus is doing in your life? I'd love for you to tell me your then-Jesus story. What's Jesus up to in your life? Is he calling you to something new? Maybe right now, maybe this week, maybe recently, Jesus has been coming saying, leave your nets and follow me. 
Maybe he's blowing your assumptions wide open by saying, I think you have what it takes. I think you're doing what you're doing because you're wanting to play it safe. Maybe you have control issues. <laughs> I think you need to follow me. Are you willing to lay down your nets and follow have you been called to follow Jesus but have kept on fishing because it feels familiar and maybe it feels safe? And God's not called us to familiar, safe living. He's called us on into the adventure of following after him, guys. Are you just waiting for Jesus or are you running away from Jesus? I mean, some of you might be saying, I'm waiting. I'm willing. Jesus, come. Call me. That's great. But some of you, honestly, if you... If you made a ruthless self-inventory, you would say, I am running away from Jesus. I'm avoiding this. He's come to me once, and I pray he doesn't come again to me because I, I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know if I'm bold enough, courageous enough to lay down my nets and trust him enough with my future. You're running away from Jesus. But today, what will you do when Jesus calls? What will you do if today is your then Jesus moment? That Jesus comes to you today. What if Jesus wants you to really follow him? What if Jesus wants you to be his full-time disciple? What if Jesus wants to come and wreck things? He wants to change your life, change your name, change your vocation, change your future. What if he wants you to lay down those dear nets, those beloved nets, those defining nets? What is it you need to leave behind? What does it need to give up if you're going to follow Jesus today? I guess that's the question. What is it you need to leave behind? What is it you need to give up if you're going to follow Jesus fully today? Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for these stories. I love it that uh, the way you come in into our midst, <laughs> sovereign, holy creator, God of the universe, comes, puts on flesh and lives, dwells among us, comes to us, calls us out of our, our, our false assumptions, our faulty understandings, believing that we have what it takes, calling us to follow after you. And this all happens in a local place. It happens in a real time among real people. I don't, sometimes it's hard to wrap our brains around it, but I think we miss something if we just read this as a far off story in kind of a fairy tale sense. But these were real people. They had real bills and they had real responsibilities. They had real encumbrances. Yet you still waded right into the middle of that in Jesus and called them to follow, called them to give up all the things that they've been using to prop up their sense of identity and sense of worth, all the things they've been relying on to make things happen and make things uh, operate and provide. God, we understand that you're calling in our life uh, brings disruption. But in that, God, we need to trust you. We need to trust you enough to follow and to believe. God, that calling is sometimes the first and biggest test of our faith. Do we believe? Will we follow? So God, I pray for my friends here that have uh, maybe been, yeah, they've been committed to Jesus. They believe in Jesus. They say, I'm a Christ follower. But really, when it comes to the following part, it's been pretty half-hearted. Or it's been pretty fearful or avoidant. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring conviction where necessary. Uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring excitement, wonder where necessary. God, a, 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 a mind-boggling, bonkers with God adventure lays before us. You've called us all to follow after you. You sent us all out to reveal and represent Christ and his kingdom in the world. So God, I pray that we'd all get off the sidelines. We'd all lend an ear, we'd tune our hearts to hear the calling that God has, that Jesus has for us. And I understand it's not all to be pastors, it's not all to be uh, overseas missionaries. But we are all called to be obedient. And the o obedience to the call of Christ is the call to be sent out, to make disciples, to proclaim the gospel, to announce that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That new, full, abundant life is possible through faith in Jesus. We've all been given this commission, this call. So I pray that we'd all be faithful, obedient, willing to risk whatever it takes to go where you send us, to follow wherever you lead. Lord, we need to sit with this. 
We need to hear you speak, so I pray that you would. I pray for each person here that they would come to grips, come to terms with their then Jesus moment. Maybe that then Jesus moment has come in years past, or maybe that then Jesus moment is coming right now. God, I pray that we would be present, and I pray that we would be brave. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Here we're going to sit for a few moments, and this is a chance for you to listen closely. Interact with the Lord. Lay these things before Him. If you've been obstinate, if you've been on the run, maybe this is a chance for you to confess that and say, I know, I know I have. Jesus, would you return? Would you call me again? Whatever that looks like, if you need to pray with someone, I'd love to pray with you. Because sometimes there's real issues that you need to work through. But don't live another day without your then Jesus moment because it changes everything, guys. If you're living your own life, then Jesus comes and changes everything. So make the most of this opportunity. Let's stand and worship God together. No things have
just the voices. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we idea and this thought this truth really impressed in my heart the last few weeks but we as a church as you know we've got plenty of room we can we can accommodate more people right but the point isn't just to get people in the building right we want to be faithful to our calling and what is our calling ours is to make disciples to, to, to proclaim to invite others in to walk with people as we start to follow Jesus to make disciples Jesus is the one who grows the church. Jesus said to us, go therefore into all the world and make disciples. Not plant churches, not grow churches, not pastor churches. Go make disciples. And he said, I will build my church. I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus' promise is that he'll take care of the church. When ours is to be faithful to our calling to make disciples. So heading into next year, our focus is going to be uh, threefold maybe first is to be a praying people trusting in the Lord for his strength his guidance and his provision pray we pray we pray secondly we love people we love people well we give up our right to need to win all the time we love people well I heard an interview with a, 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 a woman from an Islamic country, a Middle Eastern country, who was going to school in Australia, and she was starting to hang around with some Christians, and uh, she had been raised in Islamic school, so she was steeped in uh, Muslim theology and thought it was way more solid and way more, way more robust than Christian theology, what she had heard about it. But she started coming in contact with Christian students at this Australian university, and she said, I thought their theology was ridiculous, but man, how they cared for each other. I had never seen that before. How they loved each other, how they accepted and welcomed each other into their lives, I couldn't deny that. And through that love, that example of Christian loving, that Christian community, she was drawn in and then she started to encounter Jesus himself. And she became a follower of Jesus, and it was just powerful. It transformed her, but guess what? It started with love, and it reminds me of something the Bible actually says. They will know you are my disciples by your airtight theology. No, you, they'll know you are disciples by your love, the way that you spend yourself in the care of others. Man, let's pray, but then let's love well. And then, third, let's share and let's serve. We will share and we will serve. We'll share the good news in all the ways that God has given us. And we will serve people in selfless ways. Can we do that? Let's focus on that. We're going to work toward that. We're going to put some practical steps in, in place next year. But in the meantime, start praying now that we would be faithful and that God would grow his church. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be in your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our benediction is from 1 Peter 1, 3-6. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you <laughs>